morning, everyone. So today is my great pleasure to welcome our speaker, Professor Fang Ning, in this CBC Virtual Research Seminar Series. So Professor Fang received his uh, Bachelor's of Science in Chemistry from Xiamen University in China in 1998. And then he went on to University of British Columbia in Canada to do his PhD in the group of Professor David Chen in 2006. After which he moved to Iowa State University and Ames Laboratory under the US Department of Energy with Professor uh, Edward Young uh, to do his postdoctoral associate research from 2006 to 2008. And then from 2008 to 2015, he was an assistant professor of chemistry at Iowa State University and a faculty scientist at the U.S. Department of Energy, uh, Ames Laboratory. So in July 2015, um, he moved uh, his laboratory to the Department of Chemistry at Georgia State University and became an associate professor. So his research uh, is uh, multifaceted. So he aims to open up new frontiers in chemical and biological discovery through the development and use of novel uh, optical imaging platforms, uh, which provide sub diffraction limited spatial resolution, high angular resolution, uh, excellent detectability, and also nanometer localization accuracy for single molecules and nanoparticles. So his work has been a great inspiration when I was doing my postdoctoral research work in the US, uh, also in the field of super resolution microscopy. So without further ado, please join me to welcome uh, Professor Fang and his topic on um, single molecule imaging of chemical processes on nano catalysis. Uh, Professor Fang, please. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, let me share my screen here first. Uh, okay. Okay, so, um, it's my great pleasure to talk to you guys um, virtually. Uh, it has been a difficult year, almost two years now. Uh, so, so we have a lot of uh, remote meetings. But on the other hand, it's actually a blessing because otherwise it will be very difficult for me to visit Singapore to give a seminar like this. So this is a very good opportunity for me to know uh, friends uh, in Singapore. So the title of my presentation is Single Molecule Imaging of Chemical Processes on Nanocatalysts. So the, the tools that we used in our research is optical microscopy. So we use this uh, light microscopes to visualize single molecules or single nanoparticles. And we want to understand their molecular dynamics on nanocatalysts. So we we'll actually try to understand chemical reactions try to understand molecular diffusion, uh, transport through nanopause material or their uh, adsorption, desorption at defects of say 2D materials. Right? So a lot of these processes are very important to a chemist. So we want to try to use single molecule imaging to gain a uh, fundamental understanding on these processes. Now, the, as I said, the, the, the tool that we used is single molecule, uh, single particle imaging, so we have our microscopes. Uh, in, in my lab, we actually have five sets of uh, home-built microscopy systems. And then we all, always need some kind of a, a probe that can give us signal, right? So we can use organic dyes, we can use fluorescent protein molecules or quantum dots or gold nanoparticles. And this imaging probes will give us different kinds of optical signals. It can be uh, fluorescence, can be scattering, can be absorption, right? All these different kinds of signals will give rise to images of these molecules or nanoparticles. So a typical image of a single molecule looks like this. It's like a, a blur image because of this um, point spread function of this single emitters through the microscopy imaging system. And right? so we have this, this spread of photons on the camera from this kind of image, we can actually find the location of our molecule. Now, if you keep looking at the same molecule or same nanoparticle, you can actually get a time series, which is a single molecule, single particle trajectory, uh, as you can see in, in this uh, graph, right? So we can get the dynamics of the single molecules when they are interacting on our uh, nanomaterials or inside the cell or on the cell membrane, all these different kinds of uh, systems. 
Now, I also want to emphasize a very important concept that will be used throughout our today's discussion, which is uh, super localization. Um, so uh, I, I don't think this is uh, a, a new concept anymore. I mean, a lot of people are using this concept. So I want to go very briefly through the key points. So as I said, the microscope uh, will actually create image for objects, right? If we have a point emitter, uh, it goes through the microscopy lenses, will actually generate an image. Uh, it's a point spare function like this, All right? So um, we have point spare function that the, uh, the fluorescence image on the CCD camera, it will can be fitted by the point spare function or a function that, that's, that can actually depict this kind of a graph, right? So we can use Gaussian fitting, for example. Then we can actually find the very center position of uh, this image, like the photons are spread out on a small area. Now we using fitting, we can actually find the very center of this image. Now, if we keep doing this many times, we'll actually be able to find uh, the location of this molecule with statistical significance, right? So we can actually say we can find this molecule's location with a uh, localization precision of say one nanometer, two nanometer, right? So for different systems, you may have different localization precision, but this process will actually convert this fluorescence image into these dot maps, right? These dots, these dots actually represent the location of single molecule nanoparticles. So if we accumulate these dots, we'll actually get a reconstructed image of our sample. If you have dynamic information in there, you can also have this dynamic information in the map. You just need to use the time as assets to in interpret uh, this information. Okay, now this is the basic uh, concept that we use in our experiments. And it, this is a, a, a overarching like summary slide. This is actually the two major directions that um, in my in my lab, so we have single molecule chemical imaging direction. We try to understand single molecule diffusion through nanopause. So we try to ans answer questions related to nano confinement. Um, we also have uh, recently started working on two D materials. And the other direction is single particle checking in live cells. So we try to follow plasmatic nanoparticles in living cells. Okay, so we'll try to understand how these particles being transported, how they go through in the cell memory. So these are a lot, oftentimes related to molecular motors. Um, so one is chemical imaging, the other one is biological imaging with emphasis on, on motor proteins. Now today's talk is mainly uh, completely focused on single molecule chemical imaging because of uh, um, uh, this audience. Now we have the single molecule imaging technique and now the, this has been used to understand catalytic reaction on single catalyst, okay? So we, we are not the first group to start this research. Uh, as early as 2006, there was a report to show a ferrogenic reaction. Ferrogenic reaction means we have a non fluorescent molecule, give no signal, it can react, uh, can be catalyzed on the surface of catalyst and be turned into a molecule that can actually fluoresce. Right, so the signal will start to, uh, be, to be generated when a molecule is, is, is actually converted on the catalytic surface. Now, because we, can ha we have this localization information embedded in this kind of imaging, so we can actually correlate the, the uh, generation of these molecules with different structural features on the nanocatalyst. So we have different facets here. Uh, you can actually pinpoint the reaction to different parts of this catalyst. Right, so this was the first demonstration to show the single molecular activity on a single nano catalyst. Now we, we get in the game actually also very early um, using this localization concept. So at that time, um, Professor Peng Chen at Cornell University, he report on the catalytic reaction on a single gold nano rod and we report on a different system, which is actually a hybrid structure of semiconductor decorated with uh, gold nanoparticles. So these hybrid structures can be activated using either um, visible light or UV light, right? Visible light can activate the gold nanoparticles. So the hot electrons will be generated in gold and be injected into semiconductor. 
or we can use um, UV light to excite the semiconductor and then the electrons can be injected into, into gold. So we actually can have control the polarity of this material during catalytic reaction. And our experiment actually show uh, the transformation responsible to by the, the holes or electrons on a single nano catalyst. So this is a typical map of these reactions on a rod shaped uh, catalyst. That's the holes and electrons are map out on this about 200 nanometer long catalyst. Now, all of these previous studies rely on localization concept. I have been emphasizing a lot to this point, but more recently, we're actually really interested in understanding the molecular dynamics, which means we are looking at really the time series of change. Right? So we want to follow these single molecule nanoparticles over time. We want to actually get the, the molecular dynamics. Now, this is actually very challenging. As you can imagine, we were trying to look at individual molecules, it, which is already a, a challenging uh, task. And so now we want to actually have shorter exposure time at any given frame. And then we want to continuously capture the location of our molecules. So that means we actually need to have reliable, extremely high sensitivity in order to do this kind of uh, imaging. Um, so before our experiment was reported, there's actually no real study to show the dynamics uh, on the nano catalyst. Now, today I'm going to talk about two different um, systems. So the first system is a uh, nanoporous catalyst. Right? So the scientific question that is important to us and also to many of other uh, researchers in, in catalysis field is the nano confinement effects. Right? So zeolites, uh, metal organic frameworks and carbon nanotubes, these are typical porous materials that you have seen many times uh, in different kinds of systems for different kinds of reactions, right? So all of these are porous material. Now the pore structures in this kind of a catalyst is essential in defining their catalytic activities. The shape, the physical properties of the pores and the chemical properties of, of this kind of a, um, um, pore structure as well as all of these, these, these shells, the, 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 the walls, in this kind of system, the frameworks. Okay, so this kind of nano confinement would completely change the molecular dynamics. It can change the fundamental chemical mechanisms. So it's a very important fundamental question uh, in the field of catalysis to really understand what's going on in this nano confined space. But there, there is actually a lot of a uh, there are a lot of challenges in trying to answer this question at the molecular level, because this kind of a system usually is very complicated. So you expect fairly high background in this kind of a, a imaging experiment. So you won't be able to really pinpoint the locations of this uh, single molecule in this porous material, like metal organic framework or carbon nanotube or zeolites. So it has been thought about for a long time, but never, no one actually really report anything at a single molecule level in this kind of assistance. So we came up with, uh, I think now looking back, it's fairly smart idea, okay? So we, we actually completely design, uh, redesign our catalyst. So we don't rely on this uh, the catalyst that's being used, um, in industry, we don't actually take this available uh, or existing uh, catalyst. We try to come up with the idea that, that we have the, the catalyst that have all these nanoporous structures. At the same time, it's suitable for single molecule imaging. So this is one of the, the emphasis that we have been trying to address uh, in the last five, eight years, which is try to build the right system for single molecule. So this is just one example that we actually succeeded. Now in this particular system, we have core shell structures, right? So we have a silica core in the middle of this catalyst. And then this 
little balls are actually the, the metal nanoparticles, those are the reactive centers, the kinetic centers. And then we build a missile powder silica shell on top of this core, right? So it's multi the core shell structure. We have a silica core, metal nanoparticles, and then the missile powder shell. Now this missile powder shell has all of these, these uh, aligned pore structures, right? So in, in this, Cartoon, you can see the for a reaction to happen, this non fluorescent reactant must diffuse into this pore structure, goes all the way towards the end of this nanopore and then react at this location, and then it becomes fluorescent, fluorescent molecule, and then it would diffuse out. So using this system, because everything, uh, most of the stuff in here is made of silica, so it's actually transparent in our uh, imaging system. It's a very clean, uh, with a very clean background. And we also have very well defined pore structure. We can fine tune the length of this pore. We can also tune the diameter of this pore. So we control a lot of uh, these physical factors. We can also do a surface modification of this pore so we can control the chemical environment as well in this entire, uh, in this, this model system. And so this actually gave us a very first opportunity to study nano confinement effects at single molecule level. Uh, now, I must say, I didn't make this sample. I designed it, but uh, my colleague, uh, at, when I was at, still at Iowa State University, colleague uh, Wen Yuhuan, his group actually made these um, nanoparticles. So as you can see in the later uh, part of my talk, these particles are very beautiful and we have a lot of control over this. Okay, uh, also I want to mention, uh, in order to see the single molecule dynamics, we need to have a phorogenic reaction. So we have this Empress red molecule, which is non-fluorescent. It goes through this nanopore structure, um, be transformed into a uh, rest roofing, which is fluorescent, highly fluorescent molecule, and then it diffuses out. So we can actually monitor the rest roofing molecule to see uh, this, the dynamics inside this uh, nanocatalyst. So here is a slide to show uh, our nano catalyst. So the, the left one is the silica particles coated with platinum nanoparticles. And then we can build a shell on top of this particle. So this is core shell, the final product of the core shell particles. You can see this, this darker dots, those are the metal particles, and then the silica uh, core, and then the silica, uh, misopore silica shell. So the typical size of the particles are listed here. The core is 100 nanometer, um, but of course we can make it much larger, like 200, 300 nanometer, no problem. The, oh, we, in most of our experiments, we use platinum nanoparticle, but you can change it to other metal. And then the pore structure of in this TM image, the pore diameter is 2.2 nanometer, um, and then the pore length is about 120 nanometer. Uh, again, we can tune these uh, numbers. Uh, it can be 1.6 nanometer. It could also be 3.3 .3 nanometer. These are the three uh, diameters that we have tried so far. And the lens can be from 220 nanometer all the way to uh, 400 nanometer. Now, before I go into the details of our experiment, I want to show you one result that puzzled us for a long time, uh, about four or five years ago. Okay, so this is where we started our push to understand the nano confinement. From all of our single molecule imaging experiments, we get two important measurements. One is about reaction rate, and the other one is about adsorption strength, which is essentially adsorption desorption equilibrium constant um, on the nano catalyst. Okay, so in this polar structure, we have this uh, non fluorescent molecule transport through the entire pore, arriving at here, and then they get absorbed to the metal nano catalyst. A reaction happens and turn it into a fluorescent molecule and it will diffuse out. So this D here is the diffusion coefficient and K here are the reaction uh, kinetic constants and M pressure comes in, rest roofing comes out, okay? Now we can measure the reaction uh, rate constants the K effective uh, reactive ray constants. And then also we can measure the, the absorption strength of the molecule on the surface of metal center. 
Okay, now what's surprising here is if you look at the first uh, results, the ray constant, when there is no shell, which is zero, okay, there's no shell, like using this particle without a shell, the ray constant is actually seven times smaller than there is a shell. Now, this is very surprising. Think about it. When the metal reactive centers are exposed to your um, reactant molecules, the reaction actually is slower than when these metal reactive centers are protected, like shielded away from your reactant molecules, right? Common sense said this is not possible. Now, the other measurement at assumption strength here, uh, we measure the equilibrium constant. You can see we saw the shell, the absorption equilibrium constant is about two times larger than there is 120 nanometer shell. So that means when there is um, the pore structure like there, then the molecule will be less absorbed to the surface. It will, it will actually, um, the, the uh, absorption equilibrium constant will be smaller. Okay, so these are the two measurements that, that really confused us and we try to find answers and it lead to a lot of interesting studies. Okay, now just keep these questions in your mind and then we'll go through all of these measurements first and then I will explain what's the theory behind these observations. Now, this is one slide that shows all the equations and uh, mathematical models. Um, I'm, I, I don't want to go into detail of this kind of a mathematical derivation because it's probably not necessary for our talk, but uh, this is a foundation that's needed to understand the mechanism. So we, we build a system like this, the core shell particle. So we can actually also write equations based on um, the different parameters as shown in this figure, right? So we have the core, a size of the core particle and different uh, radius from for different parts. Right? So we can actually write the equations for the mass transfer through these polar structures. We can also write the equations for reaction rates. Right? We can have one set of equation based on langmuir hinshield model. Now this model actually states that the diffusion is actually not uh, really important in, in, for the reaction. Okay, now we also have a diffusion coupled langmuir hinshield model. Now this is actually the, the true model that we had used in our study. The reason we actually need to study diffusion coupled model is because clearly uh, as shown in this figure, the diffusion of our reactant and product molecules is essential to understand the kinetics, okay? So because it needs to go through all of its pore, the lens of the pore and react and then get take off, right? So, the, the kinetics has to be diffusion coupled because this diffusion is, is uh, a finite part of uh, uh, the whole, whole phenomenon. Okay, so, so this is a model that we built and we can use this to understand our system. Now I want to point out the three key measurements in our experiment is the diffusion coefficient of single molecules through the nanopore, uh, the reaction kinetics, and also the absorption equilibrium constant for the m pressure molecules. Okay, so these are the three key measurements for our single molecule imaging experiment. Now, as I said, we, we are interested in dynamics, molecular dynamics. So we actually um, re redesign and rebuild our single molecule imaging system. Now this system is based on total internal refraction fluorescence microscope. Um, and this is something that I learned during my postdoc years with uh, Professor Ed Young. He's a pioneer in using this system for chemical studies. And now in, in our new system, we actually push, um, we, we kind of like push everything to perfection. So we have a rather complicated total internal refraction microscope compared to many other uh, existing ones that used by, by even some top groups. So in this case, we have um, a very special sample holder. It can hold our sample very stably. We also have a uh, auto feedback control system that can keep this uh, prism-based total internal refraction uh, my, uh, imaging like consistent um, 
in focus for many hours, right? So that combined with our um, automated adjusting of the instant angle, we can actually achieve absolute best sensitivity um, on our microscopes. Now this allow us to push the temporal resolution to about 30 to 50 milliseconds. And before us, most of these kind of studies we use 200, 500 millisecond temporal resolution. So we, we push it to one uh, order of magnitude faster that actually indeed give us a lot of uh, new information. And uh, in our experiment, we actually build a flow chamber and we immobilize our nano catalyst on the surface of this flow chamber. So this is uh, just a bright field image of this catalyst. Each dot here is one catalyst on the surface. And so we we flow our reactant molecules and also other uh, substrate through this chamber. And now this is uh, a movie shows the captured um, reactions. Now you see these fluorescent molecules, bright spot showing up at different locations. Right, so each of these molecules actually give us one transformation of catalytic reaction. It's not one bright spot showing up means one molecule is being generated. So we can recall the positions of this molecule over time. If we do that, we we'll actually have this time trace of reaction. Now, in for this time trace, we actually just only pick on one particle. It's in this uh, uh, bluish box. Okay, so you see now it's it it show up a molecule a bright spot show up that actually means the spike showing up on our trace. Okay, so we have these traces keep going on for hours uh, for the same nano catalyst. So we can capture a lot of this on off um, information from this catalytic reaction. Right, so we have this trace. We have the fluorescent molecule generated, and it will dissociate, uh, transport out, and dissociate. Okay, so between these bursts, we have an off time. Now, if you keep accumulating this tau off in the off time, you can easily convert this off time into the velocity of your reaction. Okay, so this is the basic um, way to, a fundamental way to calculate the reaction rate from a single molecule activities. So we can keep doing this for a very long period of time. And the important information is also the localization, right? So as I said, we can have nanometer scale localization for single molecules, right? So you see one bright spot showing up. If you look at it more carefully, you can you not only just see a one spot, you actually see a, a trajectory uh, for this molecule and it's actually diffusing through the a nanopore. So this is just one in example that we captured. Right, so each dot here shows a uh, location of molecule at different time. And we can actually get its trajectory. We can actually also calculate the R here, which is the step, step size between the two frames, the two consecutive frames. Okay, so using this concept, we can actually plot the uh, histogram of these steps. Okay, now here we need to really understand the meaning of the, this, this uh, step size. So we, we did a control experiment. We first have this um, resolution molecules, which is our product molecule, absorbed on the surface. Now these are essentially the immobilized molecules. Right? So then we, we just image this immobilized molecules and we find a stop, step size for these immobilized molecules. Now, because these molecules are not really moving, so what we're really getting out of this movie is actually the localization precision, uh, this uncertainty in our measurements of these locations. Right? So this purple group is the distribution of the step size that measured for these immobilized molecules. Right? This group is narrower because this is essentially give us experimental uh, localization precision. Right? So for this one, the sigma is about, I would say seven or eight uh, for localization. And the second movie here is actually uh, a real reaction happening, right? So you see the bright spots showing at different locations. Now, if you capture the, the movement of molecules in this movie, and you will get a bigger step size, 
Now the distribution becomes much wider as in this, um, the orange group, right? So this is the histogram of the step size. And we can actually use this dis distribution to calculate the diffusion coefficients. The way to calculate this is actually just to use probability density functions. Uh, we can have multiple components in this equation. Okay. Without going into too much detail of this calculation, I just want to tell you, using this multi-component fitting, we can actually find there at least like three diffusion coefficients are needed to describe the, the molecular transport in this kind of system. The, the smallest one is for the immobilized molecules, just like the immobilized, the, the first case I showed um, on the previous slide. And the largest one actually shows the real diffusion, um, the real fast diffusing molecules. And then also we have a group in between that's a hybrid mode that shows a partially immobilized molecule and also partially diffusing molecule. Right? So these three uh, will give us this, um, the, the red, green, and the blue curves that will perfectly combine to fit the distribution of the steps. Right? That give us the diffusion coefficient of our uh, molecules in the nanopod. Now, from our measurements, the diffusion coefficient is actually about four or five orders of magnitude smaller than the diffusion in the bulk solution. Okay, so our measurements in one experiment shows it's 0 0.013 micrometer square per second. Right? If in the uh, if a molecule of resolving is freely diffusing in, in say water, in bulk solution, it, the diffusion coefficient would typically be by 480 from theoretical calculations. And so the diffusion in our nanopore is so much slower. This is actually already known. It's not the, uh, our original discovery. Now in this nano confined space, the, nano, the, the, the diameter of the nanopore in our case is 2.2 nanometer, which is comparable to the size of the resolution molecule. Uh, its length is about 1.3 nanometer. So it's actually makes the molecule less um, difficult, more challenging to, uh, to transport inside this nanopore. This confined space also makes the viscosity of the media um, much higher than the bulk solution. Okay, so uh, you can imagine the electro electric double layers in this 2.2 nanometer static nanopore, it's going to be very significant. Okay, so this will actually change the viscosity of the media dramatically. That will slow down the molecule as well. Now, finally, the last reason for this slow uh, diffusion is because of the sorption of resolution molecules on the uh, um, hydrophilic surface of silica. Okay, so, so all of these three contribute to a slow uh, diffusion coefficient measured in our experiment. Now, this is actually a very good thing because the molecule is uh, moving so much slower, so that actually make it possible for us to capture it. If they go too fast, the single molecule experiment will not work for this kind of system. Now I explain our experiments and also uh, show you the measurements. So it's time to go back to the question, the, the surprising results. Okay, I just try to um, remind you the surprising results is we have got is the, the reaction rate it's seven times faster when there's a shell when compared to there's no shell. And the adsorption strength is two times lower for, um, for a particle with a shell. Okay, now let's find out why this is happening. In order to answer this question, we actually make a whole bunch of these nano catalysts. Okay, uh, our collaborators actually make a whole bunch of these nano catalysts. So here is just some. Um, TM images of, of particles of different uh, shell thickness, different uh, diameter. Now this particular one is 3.3 .3 nanometer uh, pore diameter. Okay, so these, are, these others are, are two nanometer and this is three and also different uh, shell thickness. This one is probably 20 nanometer thick and it's 50 and goes on all the way. This one is really big. I, it's probably 300 nanometer uh, in, diam in a shell th thickness. Okay, so using this more complete set of uh, material, we can finally get our answers. 
Now, the first question is about adsorption. I, I, I'm going to answer uh, here. Now, adsorption uh, in this kind of a porous structure has a lot to do with molecular orientation. Okay, this is not actually very hard to predict. Right? So we have a metal surface in the system. Now, when your molecules, the amplifier molecules, this is its structure, it comes into the system. Now, if it attach flat on the surface, this is actually a stronger uh, configuration. It will make the adsorption stronger. Now, if it's actually tilted, goes uh, uh, approaching the surface, this adsorption is actually weaker. Okay, this is not hard to uh, imagine and predict. Now, in our nano catalyst, we have a pore. It's 2.2 nanometer in diameter and the, the length of the amperes is 1.3. So this is this confined space really restrict the orientation of the amperes thread when you approach the surface. And so this molecule oftentimes is actually have this tilted orientation. The probability of finding this molecule in this tilted orientation is much larger than, than when you landed flat on the surface. Right? We know all of this, the molecular dynamic is basically a probability question. And so in this case, we can imagine the adsorption of these molecules in the pore structure would be smaller. Like how do we actually test this hypothesis? We do a lot of measurement. We have different uh, particle sizes, right? So the, the shell thickness can be 20, 50, 80, 120 nanometer. Okay, you can see when there is a shell, uh, when there is a good shell, 50, 80, 120 nanometer, you can see the equilibrium constant is become almost a constant here. Uh, they are almost the same. And the only difference is for the 20 nanometer shell. Now this 20 nanometer shell is not a perfect shell. It could because it's not thick enough. So there's a defect in this shell. So that's why the number is in between. Okay, so this is our measurements. Now, in order to understand this, uh, wait, I, I, we also have done two different uh, pore diameters, 2.2 and 3.3 .3 nanometer. You can see for our smaller, smaller diameter nanopore, the, the equilibrium constant is actually smaller. Uh, when there's larger nanopore, equilibrium constant is higher. Now this is also understandable because when the pore diameter is larger, the molecule actually have more freedom to position in itself and have a higher probability to lay flat. Okay, so, so that's why this uh, larger pore structure will have a larger equilibrium constant. Okay, now, can we actually prove this is the case? Can we actually image the molecular orientation in a nanopore? Well, we can actually do it. It's not, not a, a super difficult experiment. So what we are trying to see here is the molecular orientation. So obviously we need to use polarization microscopy to look at the dipole of these fluorescent molecules, right? Now our system is very unique. So it actually give us a unique ability to look at the molecular orientations. As I said, our particle is uh, built on the core and the missile pore shell is around the core, right? So all these pore structures the, the pole is aligned uh, pointing from outside towards the middle core. Right? So at different locations of this, the uh, core shell structure, the aligned pole direction is actually different. That's very well defined in the system. So if we use polarized light to excite our molecules inside this, now only those pore directions, they are aligned with the polarization direction of light, excitation light, this molecule will be excited. Then we will be able to detect it, right? So indeed, this is what we see. If we use linearly polarized light to excite our sample, you can see we detect the molecules also, uh, that their distribution is also elongated in the same direction as the polarization, right? So that, that if the molecule is perpendicular to the light uh, polarization direction, and they will, it will not be excited, so it will disappear. Right? You only see the distribution along this direction. 
Uh, if we use the circulated polarized light, we basically excite everything. So all the molecules in every single pore here will be excited and you will see a circular distribution, the even distribution of all these molecules throughout the entire porous material, right? So we can actually use single molecule imaging to prove that we have, that the molecules has preferred orientation inside this nanoporous structure. Okay, now this molecular orientation is also has large to do, has a lot to do with, with the, uh, the reaction kinetics. Right, so the reason being the the reaction is driven by this uh, chemosoft activated oxygen species on the nanopart uh, metal nanoparticle, right? so, and the reaction happens at the edge of the molecule, the phenol group right here. Right, so when the molecule is approaching our metal surface with all of this chemosoft oxygen. In this orientation, the phenol group, the OH here, will be more easily react. So that actually drive the reaction goes faster, more easily. So it will lower the activation energy. Right. Again, this is our hypothesis. So we want to actually try to see, use our experiment to, to really um, confirm that the molecular orientation would change the activation energy will also change our uh, kinetics. So we measure the activation energy of our system with different kind of shell thickness, right? So this is, uh, I, I will skip the details of this experiment. This is the result. Okay, so the Y axis here is the activation energy for particles of different shell thickness, 20, 50, 80, 120, the zero here is means there's no shell. Okay, so clearly you can see when there's a very well defined shell structure, the activation energy indeed is lower. Okay, compared to this, this no shell. So the, the, the nano confinement puts the molecule in a specific uh, orientation. Now this orientation actually benefits, it's, it's beneficial in terms of uh, lowering the activation energy and driving the reaction go faster. Okay, so this is uh, clearly an uh, effect of nano confinement. Uh, again, we have done two different kind of a pore uh, diameters, 2.2 and 3.3. .3. You can see for activation energy, this is also different. Okay, so for larger pore diameter, the ad activation energy is also higher, right? Because if with larger diameter, uh, the or orientation, the molecule has more freedom to rotate, so you have lower probability to go in this kind of a tilted direction. That makes the activation energy higher, also makes the kinetics uh, slower. Okay. Now, so far, we have talked about adsorption, we talked about adsorption, uh, talk about activation energy. The last remaining question is related to the length of the pore. Okay, so all, in all of these graphs, I show you um, the measurements with different shell thickness, the different lengths of the pores, right, the pore lens. Now, the most interesting and also most confusing observation is in the last uh, graph here. So as you can see, when we increase the pore length, it goes from zero, um, 50, somewhere here, and, and 90, 120, you can see the kinetic actually increasing. Now this is again counterintuitive. You have a barrier there, when we build a barrier, thicker and thicker, make it harder for the molecule transfer, and the reaction actually goes faster, right? This is, this, this is against our, our common sense. Okay, so, so what's, what's really going on here? Now the answer again is in the reaction mechanism. So here, uh, in the previous orientation discussion, we talk about this, uh, the, the phenol groups that will actually react uh, when you approach the surface. Now, this discussion about the pore length effect is actually related to the second um, step of this reaction. So we actually have this, this, propor this proportionation reaction happening in the, in the second step. We have intermediate, right? Two intermediates that actually react to generate and lead to the final product of this resolving fluorescent molecule. So what we believe 
is our nanopore behave just like a trap to trap the intermediates inside this uh, porous structure. Okay, if it's, if it's an open structure, then the mod, uh, this intermediate would, would actually dissipate uh, very quickly in solution, in the bulk solution, right? So it will lower the reaction. But with our pore structure, uh, the nanopore will just limit the movement of these intermediates. So you have a longer lifetime to, um, and also have higher local concentration inside the nanopore, right? So all of this will facilitate the final step of, of transformation from the ampere thread to resorophane. Okay, so, so the, the length of the increasing the pore length will actually increase this trapping effect to, to increase the local concentration of these intermediates. Okay, that's actually, we believe, a reason uh, for this increased uh, kinetics, kinetics when we increase the pore length. But do we have experimental proof? Yes, we have designed another experiment to show this is indeed the case. Now in this kind, in, in this experiment, we actually try to compare the locations of molecules in the first frame, which, which is actually in the moment it's generated, and also to the molecules when throughout the entire lifetime inside the pore structure. Okay, so this is the distribution of the resolution molecules in the first frame that we captured. Okay, now what do you see here? They are everywhere. Okay, so this is interesting distribution. Now let me show you the, in the other case, now the entire lifetime of our resolution molecule in the nanopore. We, we, so, so it, in this case, we not only capture its generation, we also capture its movement. So again, it's as expected, you can see this second distribution here is all over the place. Now, this is understandable. But unusual thing is the first frame. In the first frame, the resolution molecule are also detected everywhere. Now, if you remember the structure and the metal reactive center is in the, on the core. So if the reaction happens inside, only on, the, on, the, uh, on this uh, catalyst, only on the metal surface, then it should only show up inside like in the core structure and then diffuse out. But in our experiment, we actually see the molecules everywhere, even from the very beginning that's generated. So that means this intermediate being generated and being trapped inside the nanopore, they can diffuse to different locations along the pole. And then they react to generate the final product. That's why the, the resolution models can be generated anywhere inside the pore structure. Now you may ask, in the, when you first capture it, does the molecule actually diffuse to other locations instead of just staying in a, in a place that's generated? I can tell you that diffusion is so much slower, right, as I already showed you previously. So we seen our 30 millisecond or 50 millisecond temporal resolution, the there's no way for the molecule to, gen, to diffuse all the way from the core to the, the, the outer uh, shell. Like the like 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 a distribution like this. Okay, there's no way for it to diffuse so fast. So this is our experimental proof to show the trapping of um of our intermediates. Now this is another important nano confinement effect that's experimentally proved. Now this trapping effect cannot go forever. I mean, if if you keep increasing the length of this uh, pore, now at some point it will become a problem for the molecule to be transported to the, react, uh, the metal surface, right? So that's why when we increase nanopore structure to even longer, uh, 400 nanometer, you can see the kinetics start to drop, okay? So it's, it, when it's a shorter, job, uh, shorter nanopore, it's increasing, but once it hit some threshold, it will start to fall off. Now, this is just com competition between trapping of uh, and intermediate, intermediate molecules with the difficulty to overcome the barrier for the molecular transport. Okay, now this is a, a summary of uh, things that I have discussed so far. So we have seen a reaction in nanopore. Um, it's about molecular orientations, about trapping of the intermediates. Now, 
due to a time limit, I'm not, <coughs> I'm not, I don't want to repeat myself, but I just want to point it out. This natal confinement effect is very tricky. <coughs> it's important thing is to, important thing is to recognize this is a system dependent. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> <coughs> It's system dependent. So we, we, are, we have relative um, size of the nanopore and the reactant molecule. Okay, we also have this M plus red to a rest roofing reaction. It could be different reaction, could be different uh, kind of interaction with the surface. So the nano confinement effect will be different for different kinds of uh, um, chemical systems. That's why it's, it's so tricky to actually study this nano confinement quantitatively in um, a system, but our cast, um, specially designed nanocatalysts give up a really good chance to explore many different factors um, using our system. We're still working on this kind of a using this system to understand nano confinement. Um, so you will see more studies from us in the future. Now I think I still have time to go through the second um, study that I want to talk to you about. So here we move on to a different catalyst. Uh, it's a 2D material, 2D layered material, like uh, a graphene is the most uh, um, well-known 2D material. But we, we actually use many other uh, different type of materials for our study. So the focus here is no longer nano confinement. For 2D material, there is no nano confinement. What we are really interested in is defects the defects on the 2D layered materials. So we want to understand the photocatalytic dynamics on different kinds of defects, like the edge of the uh, 2D material wrinkles, and also um, vacancies, All right? So it's well-known 2D material can be used as a catalyst um, in many important reactions like CO2 reduction, hydrogen and uh, evolution and all kinds of things. And so importance of 2D material in, in catalysis is unquestionable. And in order to improve the catalytic performance of, of 2D material, one very useful strategy is to engineer the defects. And if, if without the defects, if you have a perfect uh, material, then you are looking at the mostly just basal planes and that it's actually not good for, for catalysis. The activity of this basal plane is usually the lowest compared to all other uh, structural features uh, on the 2D material. Right? So there are many different ways to um, carry out this defect engineering. You can try to expose more edges. You can apply strain. You can also do the doping to put different kind of, a, uh, like for example, the metal reactive centers or different, just different atoms uh, on the 2D material, right? So there are many different um, ways to, to, to dope the 2D material and to improve its catalytic activity. However, these challenges there uh, that should stop us from really understand different catalytic activity at molecular level. One of the questions that always puzzle us is which defects has the best catalytic activity and why? There are many different types of defects that have very subtle structural differences. Right? In simple experiments, will not tell you the difference between these different kinds of structures. Now, obviously you need high spatial resolution in order to, to compare different kinds of uh, defects, different kind of uh, uh, structural features. Right? So we need single molecule imaging experiment to do this. But there are other technical different uh, difficulties. Uh, for example, uh, it's well known that graphene sample will quench fluorescent molecules very easily. So you don't actually easily get um, the single molecule signals on the graphene sample. And there are other um, background issues and things like that. So that's why to this point, there's no real single molecule studies on 2D material. There are many studies that try to use them um, with the fluorescence molecule, but not really at the single molecule level. And other methods that have them uh, carry out 
it, it say to and also have poor spatial and temporal resolution. So that really not enough to find the difference between the defects. So again, we use our artificial sensitive single molecule imaging system. We do in situ studies. Uh, we have nanometer scale uh, localization precision. We also have high temporal resolution, right? So we can really understand the system much better. Now, in, in our current study, we try to compare four different kinds of structural features. The basal plane, this is uh, what we used Indian serenite as our uh, material of interest. Right? So this is uh, the image of our sample. And you can see the majority of this is in the basal plane. And we also have these wrinkles. So the sample is folded uh, at the edge. And also, of course, we have the edges here. And we also have vacancies. And it's just tiny dots. And it's not visible in this um, imaging mode. But you, you will see the difference when we actually capture the single molecule dynamics. And this also visible using some other uh, extremely high spatial resolution techniques, uh, like probably STM and so on. But it's not visible in the light microscope. Right, so we want to see the dynamics on a 2D material surface. So again, we need a reaction, a phorogenic reaction. So in this case, we choose a reaction that goes from the APF to a highly fluorescent fluorescing molecule. Okay, again, a typical probe. And, and we, can, we can also carry out the ensemble measurements first. So we can clearly see this reaction is going uh, on the surface of this Indian serenite uh, material. All right, so we are all set to take the images of single molecule on the 2D material. So this is just one example of our captured activities on a piece of this uh, Indian serenite sample. So the dotted line here is actually draw on the edge of this piece of uh, Indian serenite sample. And we also, uh, this is a single frame, a single fluorescent image of this catalytic reactions on, the, on this uh, catalyst. And so over time, you accumulate these spots and you will actually have the distribution of these activities on the catalyst. So here is the accumulated, reconstructed um, reaction maps, right? You can clearly see the edge are very active. And the most active ones is actually these little dots uh, in the middle or at the edge here. Those are the vacancies, okay? So they are red because there are a lot of activities going on in, this, in these areas. The basal plane is the least uh, active locations, right? So we can compare the single molecule uh, kinetics using our single molecule uh, imaging approach. Uh, like, may I ask how much time do I have? Uh, probably about 15 minutes. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so, so we, we, single molecule imaging can give us the, in all of these molecular uh, processes on the surface of 2D material, on the surface of Indian serenite. Okay, so we have this APF reactant molecules it comes in, it's soft to the surface, right? It can also diffuse on the surface. And then the, the chemical reaction will happen. Now, in this case, you can either use the electron or the hole to drive the reaction. And once it, it finished, uh, once the transformation happened, the diffusion again happens on the surface and then it can diffuse uh, away from the, the 2D material. Okay, so different uh, molecular process can be imaged in our experiment. So uh, very quickly, uh, again, we can capture the, the fluorescent burst that shows individual molecule generated at um, a specific location. And then the, the time between the two adjacent bursts actually give us the tau off that can give you the kinetics. Okay, so this is um, same, uh, identical to the ones that we used for our nano confinement study. Okay, so we can actually calculate the, the velocity, the reaction rate for different features, right? The basal plane, edge, wrinkle, and the vacancy. And we can quantify the activities on these different uh, structural features. So this is, this is the basic information we can get from single market imaging.
Now we can also capture the dissociation of the product molecules defense, right? In this case, you can see we use the different time. It's tau on. Tau on describes how long a molecule stay for us, stay on uh, after it's generated. So the width of this peak. Okay. So this this actually give us the uh, dynamics inf dynamic information that we needed to understand the dissociation of our product molecules. Right. If once it dissociates, it would go away from the surface. Uh, it will not be imaged anymore. So the signal disappears. Right. So we can actually using this tau on, we can actually get the dissociation uh, kinetics. Now, between the adsorption and desorption, we have chemical transformation, also have this molecular diffusion. So if we keep checking the locations of the molecule, we can actually see how this, this product molecules move from um, different structural features from, for example, it can diffuse away from the vacancy after it's generated. Now it can actually find a different location before it dis dissociates from the surface. So all these are meaningful to understand the reaction kinetics, the overall reaction kinetics in the system. So the, the, this is our uh, captured single molecule diffusion data. So you see a lot of these little uh, flower shaped um, traces. Now these are single molecule traces. So from this analysis of these traces, we can see different cases. We can have um, molecules that are very mobile on the surface. You can have molecules that stay in one location after it's generated, or you can see molecules that move for a little while and then stay in one location. Right, so two different, uh, three different scenarios, immobile, mobile, or hybrid. Now this actually shows the molecule interacting with, with different defects with the basal plane. Okay, so this is real-time uh, information on how, how this interaction goes uh, on the surface. Now let us, this also help us to explain the desorption kinetics, right? So we have different ways for this molecule to dissolve from the surface. It can be a direct desorption, which needs to overcome a larger energy barrier. It could be a, a mediated, desorption mediated diffusion. It can overcome, go over a smaller bump that's related to diffusion goes to different locations and that will, this location, the new location will probably facilitate an easier dis desorption. So a lot of things could go on on the surface. We can capture all of this in single molecule imaging. Um, now, this is another very interesting slide. We're still trying to uh, understand more of these results. Now here, um, we still do the imaging of single molecules at different features of the, the Indian serenite sample. But in this case, we add either a hole or electron scavenger to the system. This hole, for example, if we add a whole scavenger in the system, it will quench the holes. So there's only electrons remained for the reaction on the surface of this 2D material. Okay? So if we add the electron sca scavenger, then we quench the electrons, then only holes will actually be uh, active to drive the reaction. Right, so now you can compare to the system without holes or electron scavenger. Now this is very interesting. You can see if we add electron scavenger, which means we get rid of electron, we only need that hole to do the reaction. And this is almost the same. Okay, so that actually tells us the whole reaction pathways is it can happen on the basal plane and also on all kinds of defects. However, if we remove the holes and we land the electron to drive the reaction, and now you only see the edge and also this, this vacancy sites are become active. So only defects are actively using electrons to drive the reaction. The basal plane um, has no activity at all. Okay, so, so this is our single molecule approach to, to really understand the roles and hope, the role that played by the holes and electrons in this, um, in this reaction. Okay, uh, this is turned out to be uh, the final slide I want to uh, talk to you about. And I want to thank my students and postdocs over the years contributing to this, the, pro uh, the chemical imaging project. 
and the two collaborators, uh, Wen Yu at Iowa State and also Shidong at Georgia State, um, to provide us with the sample and the funding from the, the National Science Foundation uh, at the United States. And just final two slides. Um, I only talked to you about our single model imaging. So this is basically total internal refresh for instance, microscopy. Uh, in my lab, we actually have many other techniques um, like differential interference contrast, uh, total internal refresh scattering, Raman com combina combinatorial uh, spectral combined single model with Raman light sheet and also other uh, storm imaging uh, for biological systems. So there are many other things that, that I, I don't have time to talk about. Uh, we have many applications, biophysics, nanomedicine. Um, I, today I only talk about nanomaterials and single model catalysis. And finally, um, to some of you, it might be uh, of interest. So I just with uh, teaching at the Boston University, we just started a new Gordon Conference. It's called Gordon Conference on Chemical Imaging. Okay, so we have a, a emphasis on using single molecule, using other uh, optical microscopy techniques to understand chemical systems, to, to also emphasizing on using chemical information to understand biological systems. Okay, so originally we plan to, to have it in 2021, uh, this year, but for an obvious reason, um, it's postponed it by, for two years. So we'll have it uh, in May or June, uh, 2023, two years from now. Okay, so um, I hope to see more of you at that meeting. And uh, this will be the first meeting on the chemical imaging. And I guess that's all. Thank you very much for your time and attention. <laughs>